good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. I have been some 15 years ago. I was with my wife in Sevilla and we visited many places and I, get, I keep a very warm memory of those moments. And I did not have an opportunity to visit this university yet, so I'm very, very happy to be with you. So what I will try to do in this inspirational moments, as they call it, uh, Kali, I will try to, um, to explain to you what we did and, um, in innate immunity and but how we went from insects to mammals. The, most, the question I get most often when I go through various places is, why did you work on insects? Are you interested in the health of flies? No, of course not. So I'm trying to explain to you um, how this came about and um, I'll uh, start with three points of introduction to make things clear to us. So one point, I'll speak about infections and their effects on human populations. Just a few slides to remind us of what uh, this is all about. And then the reasons to address insects as model systems to investigate anti-infectious defenses. And finally, I'll make a gentle reminder to those of you who are not familiar with immunology and to make the distinction between innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity, the term innate immunity has really come to the fore only in the last 30 years. Before that people would say natural, uh, natural immunity and uh, I'll explain to you what that is about and what, has, what we have learned. So, in this first slide, which is the slide when I first discovered it, uh, uh, some time ago, I would really, I found it stunning. So I'm showing here the life expectancy uh, from the Paleolithic period to present times. Now, uh, we have a lot of information. So life expectancy means the time elapsing b uh, between your birth or the birth of a uh, given subject and the time of the death. And uh, so we have, of course, a lot of information for skeletons from the early Paleolithic period. And this is life expectancy at that time. So what you want to look at is the medium, the, re the red thread, which is half lifetime. And you will see that at the age of something like 20 years, half of the population had disappeared. There always have been people who reached uh, uh, long, longer ages, but half of the population had gone by the age of 20. How did that change? Well, in the Neolithic period, a few thousand years later, there was no change. It was still the same. And then we go here and I've uh, gone uh, directly to the value of Breslau. I didn't want to impose on you the period of the Napoleonic Wars, but it was still around 25 years. Soldiers are now the civilians. This is Breslau, which is now in Poland, and they had very particular, very careful registers uh, for their deaths and uh, uh, births. And you see in 1690, current era, there was no major change. So people would still have a life expectancy about 25 years. Liverpool, United Kingdom, before joining the European Union. And here in 1860, the values show you that there was no major change. There were slight modifications, but still no major change. And then, in the UK, about 2000, you see life expectancy tripled. So how can we explain that in about uh, 100, 150 years, we tripled life expectancy of all humans on Earth? So that's a question which, of course, you may have thought of already, but which I want to address in one or two more slides. The major reasons of early mortality in the course of history were by far infectious diseases with frequent pandemics of pest, variola, typhus, measles, and so on. Child mortality resulting from infections was often enormous, up to 50% in the given population. And as I mentioned in my previous talks, I was in uh, China a few weeks ago, and in the Yangtze Kian Valley, in the 19th century, at the age of five, half of your children had died already through infection. Half of the children at the age of time. Now, the origins of these diseases were essentially unknown during millineries 
and were mostly attributed to divine interventions. I grew up in Luxembourg, and Luxembourg for, for, was for a long period Spanish territory, and so we had the same teachings as you had here, and it was, uh, of course, we had done sins, made sins and mistakes and so on, and it was punishment by the divine authorities. Now, groundbreaking discoveries in immunology and microbiology allowed a threefold increase, as we've seen, of life expectancy between 800, 1850 and 2000. What were those uh, discoveries? First of all, hygiene, antisepsis and asepsis. We have no time. I would so much love to speak to you about Samuel Weiss and uh, uh, his work, and, uh, but there's so many books around which you can uh, read, and uh, that was one of the great persons, and he died of infection at the age of uh, 45. He was in Vienna. Second point was vaccination. Vaccination was the most important medical benefit in all the history of medicine. It's estimated now that 1.5 billion of people, essentially young children, were saved by vaccinations uh, over the from the period on when it was really used in medicine. And that's only dates back to the beginning of the uh, 20th century. It was discovered by Frenchman, Pasteur, as you may know, and uh, other people in the realm. And so uh, uh, it really became used by doctors globally uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. So one billion and a half of people. If ever someone asks you on a television plateau, well, I don't want my children to be vaccinated, and I say, just tell them, 1.5 billion of people were saved by vaccination. And then antibiotics. So antibiotics appeared, um, well, they were discovered, the first antibiotic, penicillin, was discovered by, as you know, by Fleming in 1928. But it took 30 years until antibiotics really became in use in every place in Spain, Luxembourg, Germany, UK. And so uh, still, from the moment of discovery, it still takes quite some time until uh, this is in general use. Now, the point is, those are really the three major aspects which, have, which are responsible for the uh, increase in life expectancy. Now, as we know, hygiene is still globally in a, insufficient worldwide. You may remember the earthquake in Haiti and then the, uh, how cholera then took away tens of thousands of people because insufficient hygiene. And this is 20 years ago. And this is valid in many places in the, over the world. Vaccination. There, uh, in, in, in vaccination, there are important gaps in uh, the vaccine armamentarium. There are many um, bacteria for which we have no vaccines at all, uh, mainly among the gram positive streptococci, the staphylococci. And one of the most killer, uh, biggest killer particularly in hospitals, is Staphylococcus aureus. And we have no vaccine against Staphylococcus aureus. And then, as far as antibiotics are concerned, most of you are familiar, aware that there's an increasing development of microbial resistance to antibiotics worldwide. There are many reasons to that. And so, what I want to, uh, to say in this slide, we know what has changed, life expectancy, we know where the victories were, but we also know that all these victories are not permanent. And we still, we have to, I'm not defending here our approach globally, but we have to continue doing research and the pharmaceutical industry have to uh, develop research uh, to uh, keep the next generations not only inspired, Mr. Smith, but also protected from infections. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm turning to uh, the second point of my introduction. For which reason would you want to address insects as model organisms to investigate the mechanisms of antimicrobial defenses? So, uh, let me explain to you, oh, as a start of my personal uh, reasons, as I have the privilege to talk to you this day in this wonderful lecture hall, let me just remind myself of the role which my father played in this. My father was uh, a high school teacher in Luxembourg and during his spare time uh, he was uh, looking into the fauna of uh, various groups of zoological groups in Luxembourg 
and uh, trying to make an analysis in uh, correlation to what was changing at that time already, pollution and so on. And so he introduced me to uh, insect groups and I'm showing here Orthoptera, which are taken, that's grasshoppers, from my first ever publication, uh, which was a publication which I did in Luxembourg. It was written in French, but it was published in Luxembourg. So this made me very, made me, I wouldn't go as far as saying I love insects, but made me familiar with insects. And uh, there was no university at the time when I was uh, about to graduate, so I had to go to another place. If I had known Sevilla at that time, I would have come to Sevilla. I didn't know about Sevilla and its uh, important university, so I went to Strasbourg, which is nearly next door. It was two hours by train. It's in Alsace, France. And I went to the Institute of Zoology, shown here, which is an institute which you would say it's typically German. It was built by the Germans, in which had overtaken or annexed, whatever you want to say, Alsace. In, after the defeat of the French in 1870, and they built uh, this, uh, uh, this sort of building which uh, you would call Wilhelminisch Kolossal, and which very much reminds those of you who have been to German universities of uh, the style which was used at that time. Now, in this institute, there was one professor by the name of Pierre Joly who was working on grasshoppers. And uh, so uh, he proposed that I join his laboratory and do a PhD work in his uh, laboratory and that's how this story started for me. And uh, so what we knew is that insects, we knew of, uh, knew of course, they account nowadays for 80% of all species on earth. 80%, that's eight zero. And um, they are infected uh, generally, normally, all the time, I'd say by fungi, by bacteria, viruses, protozoa. And nevertheless, they're extremely resistant. And particularly, what is strange is that they put one third of humanity and livestock at risk of infectious, infections by microbes which they transmit. And at this stage, at this time, it is estimated that about, um, about 1 billion of people, now we are probably at 7.5 billion people in the world, 1 billion suffers from infections transmitted by insects. Not everyone dies, but there's a strong morbidity and the number of deaths per year is estimated to be somewhere around 50 million every year. Now, <coughs> excuse me, they transmit microbes, but they themselves themselves are very resistant to microbes. So, the, this then led us, I'm using the term of curiosity here, led us to say how come that those insects are so resistant, transmit diseases, are so numerous, play such a role in, uh, in our surroundings, in our own lives, and we don't understand the mechanisms of resistance. So this was I think a very nice question of curiosity. Nothing was really known except for phagocytosis. I'll come back to that a little bit later. So that's how I got started uh, on my own work at the time with Professor Pierre Joly. And when he retired some years, several years later, I uh, was asked to take over the laboratory and the laboratory still exists and with, I'll come back to that a little bit later. So, before going into uh, the core of the presentation, I would just think it can be useful to make a, I said gentle, because if someone in the audience says, oh, that we knew, uh, adaptive and innate humanity, so it's just a gentle manner for those who have forgotten this, at this uh, time of the day. Uh, we humans have two facets of antimicrobial defenses. One is what we now, what everyone now calls innate immunity, as I mentioned. There was a time when people would speak about natural immunity. And it was not really a topic of intense research anywhere in the world. It's an immediate defense reaction. That's to say you cut yourself uh, and uh, you will immediately have a defense reaction, which is an immunity uh, a defense, uh, which has no memory. And that's an important point. That's a point which is going to be the interface between in and active immunity in my presentation. So in innate immunity, there's no aggressors. So it doesn't help to cut yourself every morning. And then <laughs> the reaction will always be the same until uh, really 
it's too much for you. Now, adaptive immunity, so in its immunity, the central uh, blood, type, blood cell type is phagocytes, and phagocytes have appeared all in, uh, during evolution. And it's only one of the um, uh, cells in our system uh, implied in innate immunity, there are many others, but we have, of course, no time to go into this this afternoon. Now, adaptive immunity is restricted to lymphocytes, and the lymphocytes have appeared in evolution, we'll see that a little bit later, have appeared in fishes. And it's a slow reaction, it takes several days, and has a vast repertoire of receptors. So this will be of interest to us a little bit later, and it has memory cells. And the presence of these memory cells allows for vaccination. Now this is a very simple uh, compendium of uh, experiments which were done all over the world by many people with many uh, pathogens or many bacteria. This is the kinetics and it's interesting to see that innate immunity comes to the fore nearly immediately but it disappears after five to seven days. Adaptive immunity appears only after five or seven days and adaptive immunity can, according to the type of microbe, according to the stage of your own development, can last until the end of your days. Now, with that, well, this triple introduction, uh, let's go then into the core of the presentation. And part one will be the Drosophila host defense against bacteria and fungi. First studies in Strasbourg. I should say, well, we were, we were among the first to uh, address this question, but there are many groups now around in the world who do this, and the first trip just refers to uh, the way we have done this work. And um, now, uh, this is a very basic experiment which we did. Initially, we, we worked on grasshoppers. I have no time to tell you what we did with grasshoppers, and then we went to big blowflies. Uh, for technical reasons, and finally we went to Drosophila when Drosophila became available as a wonderful model for a model for uh, genetic uh, genetic studies and for uh, molecular genetics. So in this slide we have pricked a fly on one of the sides. Occasionally I say left side, and then I turn around, and it's yeah, it is still on left side. Uh, SMI. So you prick it with a needle which has been dipped previously into any type of microbial culture. You select which culture you're interested in. And then after given time intervals, you take off blood. Uh, the blood you call insect blood is called hemolymph. You take it off. And then here in this experiment, so early experiments in the laboratory, uh, we looked for antimicrobial activities, potential antimicrobial activities, with a very simple growth inhibition assay. So this is a really basic experiment. Nothing spectacular. But what was spectacular was then we found that in a cell-free hemolymph, so we've taken away the phagocytes and all that, you find the appearance with this growth inhibition assay of a potent antimicrobial activity, antibacterial in this case. There's nothing in controls. So this was the basic, the first really uh, moment when we thought we are, we are holding something in our hands. We have a strong inducible reaction. Now, this begs several questions, but the first question, of course, what is the nature of the effector molecules? What molecules account for this protection, which we have induced by the initial pricking? And uh, Hans Bormann, whose picture I'm going to show in a moment, Hans Bormann in Stockholm, that's my email, an email comes, but I'm not going to look at it. <laughs> Hans Bowman had uh, worked on, um, not on grasshoppers, but on butterflies, and he had uh, isolated from the nymph of Hyalophora cecropia, a very nice butterfly. He was at that time, he was working at Harvard, but his uh, hub was Stockholm. He had isolated a small peptide, cationic peptide, which he named cecropin after the moth. So nothing was known in the fly, but we thought possibly we are going to find also as such peptides, which we had not yet at this stage. And if we were to find that the molecules accounting for this inducible activity were peptides, we would want to look then, second question, at the control of the expression of the genes, of course, uh, once we would have cloned those genes. That was a second type of question. And the last type of question is, how does the insect know that it is being infected? Does it have receptors? And can those receptors discriminate between fungal infection, gram-positive, gram-negative, and so on and so on. 
So this, uh, in essence, is what I'm going to uh, explain to you within the next 10 to 15 minutes, the answers to this. I should say that we were a large group, the group is still large, and um, we were intensely working together, but uh, the next three slides took us, I would say, seven to ten years to generate. So, be patient with me. Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, found, and this was in keeping with what other people uh, found during the same period, that the site of immune reactions, the essential site in Drosophila, are fat body cells. Fat body is sort of equivalent of the mammalian liver. Also blood cells, but the adult fly, on which was our model organism, has very few blood cells, about 500 per individual. And I had selected the adult fly because during development there is an influence of the, of the endocrine system on various immune reactants and that was complicating the stories and so th this is still something uh, to have been worked out. So all, all what I'm going to show you now in the next few slides comes from adult flies, male or female. So we could over the years isolate seven families of inducible antimicrobial peptides. The first one which we isolated we named diptericin, then atacins, then rosocin, and finally cecropians, the analogues of what a woman had found in cecropia moth. All these molecules are predominantly active on gram-negative bacteria. So they're produced in the fat body and they're secreted into the hemolymph or the blood, if you wish. Then we found defensins. Uh, so defense shown here, the three structures we all have established in the laboratory. Peptide uh, structures and so were relatively accessible to us uh, relatively early on because Strasbourg has a very strong tradition of uh, chemistry and has even boasts three Nobel laureates right now still involved in uh, research, which is in contrast to biology. And uh, so, uh, defensins active on gram positives, against gram positives, and finally a molecule, two molecules which were important for the future research in laboratory, one antifungal, drosomycin, we named it drosomycin, and uh, the other, we named Metchnikov in, in honor of Metchnikov, whose picture I'm going to show a little bit later. So, uh, again, one summarizing word, and I'll uh, leave this slide. So, what we, the answer which we brought over many years, <laughs> many people in the laboratory, to question number one is that in response to a, what we call an immune challenge, injectional pricking, of a bacteria or fungi, we have the induction and in the liver equivalent of the fly of a battery of antimicrobial peptides. And those are families. You see drosomycin, there are seven different drosomycin. I'm ashamed to say in front of Mr. Smith that we only know the function of one of the drosomycin. We don't know yet the other, and so we're, we're looking for very good postdocs, particularly from Spain, to help us develop this story. It has not, I mean, that again, today it will be easier with CRISPR-Cas9 to knock them out one after the next and then to look at what is... Okay then, so they are secreted into the blood of the fly where they reach a very high concentration. That was a surprise. They reach concentration uh, order as put here 500 micromolar, which is exceptional. And uh, in uh, biological systems. And they are membrane disruptive. Uh, Hans Bormann, who had uh, discovered cecropin, uh, he pioneered the studies on the mode of action, and there are large groups of people who have done that, and we still are not sure exactly how they act, but they act. And this, uh, for us, is uh, the essential point right now. They have activity spectra which are relatively large, depending on the dose, the type of microbe, and when I say they are antifungal, they also can act on some gram-positive bacteria and so on, but this is not important for us at this stage. So let's leave this slide and then attack the next question, which was much more difficult. How are the genes encoding these molecules? How are, they, how are the genes controlled in the expression following this microbial challenge? We knew that it was a quick process. So when we cloned the genes, we started with the pterosin gene. The pterosin was the first molecule which we had identified and characterized. And so it was also the first gene in this context which we cloned. So when we cloned this gene, we found that in the promoter sequences there were uh, nucleotide sequences, in the promoter's nucleotide sequences, which were similar to Kappa B response elements, 
which David Baltimore had identified in a study on lymphoma cells with one of his postdocs, Sun by the name, from Korea, uh, a few years earlier. And um, I've met David Baltimore many times since, and he always says they did not realize that that molecule was so important. And turned out over the years to be a central transactivator, meaning a central protein which binds to the promoter sequences of response genes and controls the transcriptions. So uh, when I'm in front of a larger, of a, a lay audience, I would say they are postal addresses. And uh, so, um, and the, uh, post, the postman would be uh, NF kappa B, nuclear factor B. So I'm coming back to that in a second. So David Baltimore is shown here. And uh, David Baltimore then um, uh, went on to other studies. And uh, so um, what we did is we mutated these sequences, which you can do relatively easily now. You could do it also in those days. We mutated, uh, mutate the sequences, start the experiment again. And to our happy surprise, we saw that the antimicrobial peptides were not inducible anymore. We even saw that the flies could not respond to infections anymore and would die off. So would the fly have an nf kappa B family mem member? And uh, that was a very big question. At that time, I should say, all of the people around asking similar questions in similar models or different models were thinking of lectin cascades. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, mammalian immunology, you know that the complement pathway, can, the complement system can be activated by what is called the lectin pathway. Not only this, also uh, the alternative pathway and the classical pathway. But the lectin pathway is strong, is strong in use. And we were misled also at the moment by the observations by Ivanaga in Japan that lipopolysaccharide in the horseshoe crab induces um, lipopolysaccharide, so the essential component, one of the essential components of gram-negative bacteria, induces a lectin pathway. So, uh, do we have lectins here or do we have NF kappa B? Now, the point is that, and this again is uh, what you would call a lucky event for us, Christiane nussland vollard in Tübingen in Germany had done uh, unbiased mutagenesis screens on flies, giving uh, mutagenes uh, in the food of adult flies and screening the embryos for uh, mutants for the dorsoventral axis and the anterior posterior axis. So they were screening the embryos in newly laid eggs and one in 3,000 would show a very strong phenotype, a mutation. And so they give names to those mutant flies and uh, to those uh, isolates. And uh, then by, uh, when they carried on, uh, a few years later, uh, the identification, cloning of the corresponding genes, you know, when you have a, a generated mutation, you don't yet know what the gene is which you have mutated, if it is unbiased, as she did it. And then it turned out in her studies that one of the molecules which was required for dorsoventral patterning in the early embryo was an apparent member of the nf kappa B family. So, this then put us in a situation where we were wondering would the fly, so this was in early embryos, would the fly later in development, when it gets infected, would it also use a member of that family and would that be the solution to our essential question number two. Now let me just illustrate, because it's so beautiful, uh, the story of nf kappa B as it has been worked out many years later in a mammalian system by a whole series of scientists but it's a nice illustration of what goes on. And um, so this is NF kappa B. NF kappa B is in the cytoplasm. It doesn't go in the into the nucleus because it is bound to an inhibitor protein, which goes, accordingly, by the name of I for inhibitor kappa B. So you have this couple of NF kappa B and I kappa B. NF kappa B has a nuclear uh, translocation signal, so it would like to go into the nucleus go to the postal address and do its activity there, but the inhibitor keeps it from doing so. Now, this inhibitor is then activated, is changed, um, and yeah, this inhibitor is uh, uh, phosphorylated by a kinase, IKK, and as a result, the inhibitor changes the conformation, get de gets detached 
from uh, L of kappa b, which can then go into the nucleus. I kappa b is degraded in the proteasome, and as a result, free N of kappa b will dimerize, and the dimer will go into the nucleus and bind here on DNA at the level of the postal addresses. This is a nice um, butterfly image. Two molecules of NF kappa B set free from the inhibitor I kappa B. So, now, the important, it's, I mean, I like to give, uh, show this slide because it gives you something to, to see. Right? It gives you an image, not only theoretical names. And, and the message here, the essential point in this is that the system is present before the development starts in the case of uh, the New Science Fallout Development Studies or in the case of uh, infection, immunity, everything is present and a small signal, very rapidly, in matters of seconds or minutes, let's say, will allow for the nuclear translocation of N of kappa B, the potent transactivating factor, and which will then uh, be able to uh, bind to the postal address, as we said, to nf kappa b response element, and uh, lead to transcription of the immune response genes. So, uh, we started this work then, um, and um, with a lot of courage, and a lot of disappointments. Uh, first of all, um, as always, when you want to do an experiment, and say this to the young people, there are always people around you who would say, uh, just don't do it, it's nonsense. The idea is nonsense. Uh, you know, people told us if this were true, then the early embryo would be full of antimicrobial peptides, and that was not the case. And so on. So you would say, well, all this is, uh, has been discovered in adult females, for adult females, egg laying, and so on. And uh, this is certainly not valid for males, and so on. But so we did the work. And um, then um, uh, what we found was that indeed NF kappa B was involved in the control of expression of some antimicrobial peptide genes, as shown here. And uh, in addition, what we found is that one of the molecules identified in the uh, embryonic cascade, one of those molecules played also a crucial role. Now, that molecule has gained some, uh, some celebrity in uh, immunity, and that molecule is called TOL. It was a white TOL, Nusland Follard. Again, you are with me. She screened embryos which were abnormal, which didn't develop normally. And among those, there was one which was really very funny, and in German that can sound like TOL. So she said, this is TOL, the embryo is TOL. That was long before they had cloned the gene, and they knew what it was all about. So TOL was in those you meant those of you who are familiar with genetics so in the epistasis experiment, TOL was somewhere in the middle. It turned out later to be transmembrane domain, as shown, transmembrane protein, as shown here. And now, this important point, cactus, again referring to the phenotype, we're not going into detail of that. Cactus also turned out to be involved in the cascade, but cactus had the function of the inhibitor of David Baltimore, I kappa B. So we have this cascade, now how does it get activated? Is it by recognizing fungi, bacteria? No, it becomes activated via a cleaved form of a cytokine, and that cytokine goes by the name of Spätzle. Now, those of you who know German cuisine, which is so German cooking, gastronomy, you can call it gastronomy if you wish. I don't, but you can. And so uh, uh, you, have, you, you imagine it's some sort of a noodle, and you imagine a German spaghetti, and you can see the embryo which was mutated. You have an idea of the phenotype which it generated. So, uh, Spätzle and that, so what we understood is that this system is relevant for the induction of antifungal peptides and uh, some antibacterial peptides. But we also found, and this had not been foreseen in any way, that they are tall independent uh, control mechanisms, and so we, uh, we unraveled a mechanism induced by gram-negative uh, bacteria, which we call then IMD for immune deficiency. Also, Alsace is re renowned, renowned for its gastronomy. We did not select a term of the Alsatian. We could have called it choucroute, but we preferred uh, being neutral and IMD immune deficiency. 
So, in essence then, what this told us, the experiment, I'm going to finish on this now, told us there are two pathways, but both will eventually activate NF-kappa B. They will eventually activate NF-kappa B, either by removal of the inhibitor cactus or by cleaving uh, the whole molecule, which is also going on in the mammalian system we now know. So, the TOL pathway and the MD pathway as they go. But, still, this did not tell us uh, what um, uh, the real receptors were. Because, when we went further, well, before going further, what we wanted to do is uh, to show that uh, this was really relevant for the survival of the flies, as to say, for everyday life of flies. So we were looking at the survival of tall pathway mutants, and this is with Aspergillus, which is um, uh, fungus, pathogen. And you see in the tall mutants, after two days, half of the population of the flies, which under experiments, have already died out. Wild types survive for much longer. And when you do the converse experiment with IMD pathway mutants, you see that uh, in this case, and this is a challenge with E. coli, gram-negative bacteria, you see that the IMD mutants uh, die off very quickly, whereas wild types survive pretty well for a certain period. Now, uh, this then uh, sort of helped us conclude on the... Not, well, it helped us, uh, it helped direct us in the, right, in the good direction. We found rapidly that toll is not a receptor for the infections but it is downstream of the receptor. And that again took several years in the laboratory to really address those true receptors. And I'm summarizing that in this slide. Fungi or fungi interact with a circulating protein which goes here by the name of uh, glucan binding protein. They're free of those in the fly. That will activate a proteolytic cascade in the blood this cascade has now been fully characterized, uh, so we know all the members of this, but we're not going to that today. And this cascade will end up by the last uh, part in the cascade will cleave Spätzle, and cleave Spätzle then interacts with the toll receptor. And that, that will activate NF-kappa B, in this case uh, a molecule called DIF and dorsal, but again, I'm not going to insist on this, and producing effector molecules. Now, it is uh, of importance to stress at this stage of my presentation that toll is not a receptor for microbial uh, elements, microbial structures, microbial patterns if you wish. But it's secondarily activated by a cleaved circulating cytokine if you wish. This is the case for TNF for instance. Now, uh, gram-positive bacteria interact with uh, peptidoglycan recognition protein also in the circulation. And this will also lead to activation of the same proteolytic cascade and then eventually lead to activation of the toll pathway. And again in this case, gram-positive bacterial peptidoglycan does not interact the directive toll. In the case of IMD, we could show that here really peptidoglycan interacts directly with the transmembrane receptor, which uh, is named peptidoglycan recognition protein in this case, and that will activate not an amplification cascade in the blood, but will activ activate on the membrane the so-called IMD pathway. Now, let me just, and then lead to pro uh, expression of uh, effector genes. Let me just say at this stage that um, these signaling pathways in the cells are very complicated, but they are well understood now. We are not going into this uh, in this presentation because it would take much too long. But just that you feel reassured it has all been worked out. Mm -hmm. And I'll say just a word of this a little bit later. So now having transformed you into specialists of Drosophila immunity, let us turn now to the second part of the presentation and say how we came from flies to humans, how this process went along. Now, first of all, while we were doing the experiments on the, trying to isolate the inducible antimicrobial peptides, <coughs> Bob Lehrer in the United States and Tom Gens, both at UCLA, who have become good, <coughs> become good friends over the years, had tried to find if similar molecules were present first in rabbits, then rats in mice, and finally in humans. And again, this beautiful slide 
I'll summarize, summarize it in one word. Yes, we do produce antimicrobial peptides. We pro massively produce antimicrobial peptides. Up to 10 grams of those peptides per day, as was calculated by Bob Lehrer. But we do not produce them in the way of the insect, that is to say, secrete them into the blood. We produce them at the level where microbes can interact with our bodies, that is to say, uh, lung epithelium, uh, your genital tract, gut epithelium, and so on. All those sites of uh, interface between the external milieu and the internal milieu. We do produce some in neutrophil cells, for instance, but they will in situ uh, participate in the bacterial <laughs> killing. So, uh, this, is, uh, this was, of course, very important, and it still is very important. Uh, there are many studies going on on this now, in particular, as you know, there's been this fantastic, uh, fantastic, fantastic new discoveries on the gut microbiota. Now we know that uh, we have uh, microbiota nearly, again, every side we have on our skin. We have them uh, uh, in, of course, uh, your genital tract and so on and so on. And uh, so we have ten times more microbes uh, with us than cells. They are outnumbering us by far. Now, uh, the, uh, an interesting point here is that uh, when these results became available, so what we knew now at that stage was, number one, uh, humans and mice and flies produce antimicrobial peptides. In the fly system, which was a little bit more advanced in terms of control of expression, we need NF-kappa-B. But that NF-kappa-B, B, as I mentioned, is also central activator, trans-activator of immune response in many mammalian systems, particularly in lymphoma cells. So at that time, one essential question, to which I come back in a second, uh, in the community uh, of, in, um, of immune studies, innate or adaptive, was if the two systems interacted. And some scientists believed that maybe the innate immunity was the first filter to detect infection and then would activate the adaptive immune system. One of the proponents of this was Charlie Janeway, uh, who has shown here. So at that time I was, uh, AstraZeneca did not exist in the form it exists now. So I was contacting as many uh, pharmaceutical companies as I could. And it was only Ron Poulenc, which is now part of Sanofi in France, uh, who uh, reacted positively and they said they, they would finance a meeting for us on innate immunity and their staff uh, would be present. And I had organized this in Versailles in 93. And this was arguably the first international conference specifically devoted to innate immunity, which, which still was not a fashionable topic. And we had vertebrates and invertebrates coming together. So we were exchanging our information essentially on mice and on flies at that time. Many more organisms uh, have been studied since, but at that time it was really mice and flies. And uh, of course, uh, for people like uh, Charlie Janeway, who was at Yale, uh, also human cell lines. I also want to show Alan Zikovitz, with whom I've been interacting now for nearly 40 years. And uh, his, um, he was at uh, Harvard uh, Medical School, and he was interested and if we had time, it would be so nice to go into detail. He was interested in what he called anti, anti-body immunity. So anti, Latin word anti, before, anti-body, the antibodies. So in what happened before the antibodies were there. So that was very close to our interest because the fly, of course, has no uh, adaptive immunity. I should have said that uh, as a starter. So um, we really found an interest of interacting and then we got involved in this together. So we build up. I uh, also want to show Bob Lear, I've shown him already, and Hans Bowman from Stockholm. And uh, Janeway and Bowman have passed away 10 years ago. So um, at this stage, um, what we thought is that if we do the, bo the two systems, we can go much more, it's going to be quicker, and particularly will show us what has been conserved in evolution and so on. We applied for a Human Frontiers in Science grant which is an important uh, support, and we got that together with Janeway and with um, uh, Alan Zikovitz. And so for five years we were interacting very closely, and this had really, um, I would say, a positive effect uh, in the subfield. 
and I'll explain that to you in a few moments. So here comes the question now, which I've pointed out. Is there an interaction between innate, innate and adaptive immunity? Yes, postulated Jane Wayne. Yes, said other people, like shown here, Ralph Steinman. Incidentally, Ralph Steinman was one of the co-laureates in our 2011 prize with uh, Bruce Beutler. So Ralph Steinman was a proponent, uh, a proponent of this idea, and it's illustrated in a very simple slide here, where you have, uh, this is a mammalian system, a dendritic cell, which is an innate immune cell. And this cell will recognize microbial fragments, either in the surrounding uh, milieu, in the blood and the lymph, or c coming from phagocytosis process, which specialists call cross-presentation, we're not going into that. As a result, there will be activation of NF-kappa B, and then innate immune genes will be induced, namely antimicrobial peptides, but still at that time that was not an, an, um, a question of interest, antimicrobial peptides. It has become ever since, as I mentioned to you. Very important now. So, what was important to uh, Steinmann was that they believed that this would activate the adaptive immune system. So, innate immunity would activate the adaptive immune system. And I'm uh, coming to, uh, I will come back to that in more detail or in more precise terms at the, in my conclusions. So, this was really the central problem at that time of research in the overall community of immunologists. Would innate immunity be first filter and tell, okay, careful, there's an infection, and then adaptive immunity would then produce all the antibodies and the cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes and so on. Now, the point was that to address this experimentally, the situation was blocked because the receptors were not known. Coming back again to uh, Janeway, who I'm shown uh, a few minutes ago, he, they were looking in his laboratory at lectins, other people were looking at lectins, and so when we came in 96 with uh, the presentation that we had, uh, toll involved, I should say involved, remember that, it's not the receptor in the fly, involved but activating NF-kappa B. They knew that, of course, in this story, as you see on my slide here, NF-kappa B responds to activation of this receptor. Okay then, so um, they uh, were very excited, of course, our colleagues, and uh, the first time I presented our results was at a meeting in um, Anisquam, uh, organized by Charlie Janeway, that's close to Boston, and uh, showed the results which had been obtained uh, in the laboratory by Bruno Lemaitre, Jean-Marc Reichardt, and um, students, pointing to a role of toll. Janeway went out and they were looking if they were homologue, and they cloned rapidly within one year, a human homologue of Drosophila toll, and showed that it does signal activation of adaptive immunity. There were many, re not many, but some reasons to, uh, in favor of the idea that something similar would be involved, because the intracytoplasmic part of the interleukin-1 receptor, interleukin-1 is the major pro-inflammatory cytokine in our system, is very similar to that of the intracytoplasmic domain of the toll-like receptor, or the toll receptor. And then, in a totally independent way, Bruce Beutler, uh, <coughs> excuse me, shown here, uh, found uh, the LPS receptor. Now, Bruce Beutler was working on um, the TNF pathway and uh, tumor necrosis factor pathway. And he was looking, and that is strongly induced by lipopolysaccharide. All uh, gram-negative bacteria are full of lipopolysaccharide on their outer membrane. And so um, the idea was that finding this receptor of lipopolysaccharide would allow it to go uh, rapidly further. And now, there had been a mouse line around for nearly 20 years at that time, which did not respond to lipopolysaccharide and which did not respond to, did not suffer from the endotoxic shock, which is that shock which you receive when in situations in hospitals when you have been cleared of uh, microbes after the infection, but you still die from organ failure because you have this shock resulting from the action of uh, uh, the cytokines which have been induced to start with. So then when uh, Bruce Beutler cloned this with his group here, 20 people, they cloned it by positional cloning, which is a very uh, labor-intensive way, and it took them five years to clone it. 
and in the end, it turned out to be also a toll-like receptor. I'm uh, pointing out normally uh, in my presentation at the time the progress in uh, methods. Uh, we, to identify uh, our antimicrobial peptides, it took us uh, pricking of 100,000 flies, individual flies. So it takes a big lab to do that. And it, it takes a lot of conviction to tell people to do it and people to follow the instruction. And now it would take us not 100,000, but maybe 10 flies to do the same work. Bruce Beutler and his colleagues here took five years in the position of cloning. And now during his Nobel lecture said it would take them two days to get the same result. And recently he told me, he's in Dallas now, that one afternoon would be enough. So this is enormous progress, which is really um, leading now in the sort of projects which you want to develop at, uh, in your situation nowadays, because there are methods available. The questions, many questions are still there, but there are methods available which allow it to go very quickly. Now, uh, after this, there was a whole explosion in the community. And uh, we ended up, the community ended up, um, I mean, we have, been, we have uh, been sticking to the fly model, but the community ended up by finding that there are a dozen of toll-like receptors in uh, mice and uh, approximately the same number in humans. And Shizu Akira, whom I show on this slide, in Osaka, Osaka University, Shizu Akira uh, has, has done knockouts of uh, most of these, or nearly of all of these toll-like receptors. And I just illustrate here and summarize uh, the toll-like receptors in our system, in the mammalian system, are on the cytoplasmic membrane or inside the endosomes, which is also extracytoplasmic space, if you wish. And they scan for uh, the presence of microbial patterns, cell wall determines, to activate the system and to, uh, to tell that an infection is going on. And after recognition, through their intercytoplasmic domain, they activate act adapter proteins. I'm not going to the names of these. And eventually will activate NF-kappa B or in the case of vertebrates, but only vertebrates, IRFs, which will lead to production of interferons. Interferons are an essential, uh, essential uh, aspect of our defense against uh, viruses, but they're not present in invertebrates. So that will then lead to antimicrobial peptides and to activation of adaptive immunity. Now, this brings us back to uh, Steinmann. So the hypothetical receptor is now replaced by toll-like receptors. And the whole cascade is the same. Let me just introduce, because it has become so important over the last 20 years, that the presentation of the antigen, let's say originally from microbial uh, um, proponents, that uh, is done by the uh, MHC, Major Histocompatibility Complex. Peptides are presented, and then uh, there is a second signal here which has become very important, that is a signal for co-stimulation. Co the first time I heard of co-stimulation was at this meeting with Charlie Janeway in Anisquam, about, he spoke about the family of co-stimulators, the B7 family, and this has become extremely important now. And all what you hear about immunotherapy over the last 15 years is linked to co-stimulation at a given moment, at a given level to molecules which have been largely identified now, which were unknown, of course, at that time. And then the cytokines, which are shown in the bottom part of the slide, cytokines which activate dramatically, boost dramatically the adaptive immune system. And even so many of these cytokines, different cytokines, they will sort of orient the immune, the adaptive immune response. Now, um, the involvement holes and TLRs uh, in the system how am I doing with time? Well, I better go to the end of it. <laughs> yes, I get the instructions from my colleague here. From, so the uh, toll-like receptors initially were identified, as I've shown now to you, by their role in infection. But we have learned ever since. And around the year 2000, still most of us in those meetings believed that this was the essential role of uh, of the toll-like receptors. It is an essential role, but it's not the only role. They're also involved in inflammation, even in sterile inflammation, without the presence of any microbe. 
They also play a role in vaccination, uh, namely in uh, recognizing adjuvants. They're not the only recognizing molecule receptors of adjuvants, but they play a central role. In autoimmunity, they play, play a very important role. Autoimmunity is essentially based on TLRs. And in immunotherapy, which we can leave for the discussions later, which is one of the most exciting new developments in uh, mm -hmm. immunity, in biomedical um, events, and then in the central nervous system for reasons which we do not fully understand. All the cells in our brain and the central nervous system express toll-like receptors, and most of their functions remain to be investigated. And in the kidney also, all the cells present in the kidney express toll-like receptors. So you see, we're in the presence of a group which plays enormous, enormous, enormously important functions in our physiology, in, of course, the disease. But most of these are not understood in detail yet. And uh, now, so I would have liked to uh, close here, but then we thought, as I mentioned again in 2000, that these were the receptors, and that was too short. Because sensing infection is done in the extracellular space, as I mentioned, by toll-like receptors, the 12 of those. Uh, some lectins, I'm looking here at those which induce NF-kappa B and all the cascades. Lectins, the dozens of lectins, but only two induce NF-kappa B. But then, in the intracellular space, there are many infections by bacteria, by viruses, and which are not recognized by toll-like receptors. And so, to take you shortly through this, uh, now, in, uh, after 2000, uh, not like receptors were discovered by Sansonetti and his group at the Pasteur Institute. And uh, they play, there are 23 in humans, they play a central role in the various aspects of uh, our reactions against infections. Namely, they are controlling the cleavage of pro-interleukin-1. Again, interleukin-1 is our central pro-inflammatory cytokine. It is produced as a pro-molecule and in the cytoplasm it's cleaved by caspase, which is activated via what goes here by the name of inflammasomes, which is downstream of uh, those, uh, this type of receptors. Then uh, receptors for intercytoplasmic RNA, the Riga-like receptors discovered in Japan in 2004 by Fujita, there are three of those. They recognize intercytoplasmic RNA as I mentioned. And then finally recently in Dallas, uh, James Chen discovered a system which recognizes intracellular DNA, which is the sea gas sting system. I would be so fascinating to speak about all that, but we, we do not have time. And I see that my organizer, Mr. Smith, is becoming impatient. So I'm sort of closing on this aspect here now. In the end, through NF-kappa B, be it activated by toll-like receptors, or activated by uh, two of the lectins here, by not like receptors, by Rig ins one will lead to expression of innate immune genes. And now we know that, for instance, in a macrophage, about 1,500 innate immune genes being induced in these conditions, under these conditions, most with unknown functions. And activation of adaptive immunity. Now, in, uh, in closing, I would uh, like to say, I grew up as a zoologist, and what interests me, of course, very much is the evolution of the system. So a question which I often got was, well, when did this system appear? Flies are not the ancestors of mice, vice versa, neither. So um, in the fly, just in one word, there is no, there are no not like receptors, no recognized receptor. There is this uh, system of CGAS thing, but that would take us f uh, much too far to go into detail. Let us just look at the general things. And in this slide, you know, now we have information about more than 10,000 genomes, thanks to the facilities of uh, sequencing uh, which have appeared over the last 15 years. Now, initially, we thought that what we had been working on had appeared with the insects. Not at all. It turns out that the sea anemones, which have appeared 500 million of years before insects, or 400 million, um, uh, that sea anemones have all the armamentarium, which we found in the fly, and even much more. The fly has secondarily lost some of the uh, molecules. For instance, not like receptors, which I've mentioned now, are present in the sea anemone, 
but they have been discarded by the fly. Same is true for rig iron receptors and so on. So everything which I've been talking about to you now is present in most of the worms with the strange exception, exception of C. elegans. But C. elegans is apart from everything. The crustaceans in uh, spiders and so on and so on. In the fly, of course, in Amphioxus. So this is really the basic system which has appeared early and which is present in 95% of all organisms of all species on Earth nowadays. And something, a big change has come when vertebrates appeared. And I always get uh, some reaction uh, in the audience when I show Natalie Portman. She's my preferred actress. But I initially I had put uh, Pope uh, Francis there, but then my secretary was upset and she changed to Natalie Portman, knowing that I liked her. So um, the important point here is that in vertebrates, innate immunity has been, as I've pointed out uh, repeatedly during my presentation, has been conserved fully as it appeared in sea anemones. They're so close in the innate immune reaction to uh, mammals and to humans, uh, sea anemones. But then adaptive immunity appeared, and the adaptive immunity is relatively well understood now, appeared in lymphocytes, in uh, uh, ancient ciliations, cartilaginous fishes, as a result of an introduction of retrotransposer, an activation of retrotransposer, two events, one cutting the immunoglobulin genes into fragments, and the second putting them at random together again, which is at the origin of this enormous repertoire. Now, I am at the end of my presentation. If you allow, I would just like to uh, make a few conclusions and go slowly through these conclusions with you. And um, so these are the, point, the sort of take-home messages which I would like to give after this lengthy talk, saying that our understanding of innate immunity and its relationship with adaptive immunity has undergone a paradigm shift at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. We now have a fair knowledge of the structures and functions of the receptors of innate immunity and of the signaling pathways they govern. These pathways mostly lead to the activation of transcription factors, think of nf -kappa b and subsequently to expression of large cohorts of genes whose products concur to fight, namely, invading microorganisms. Of course, in steroid inflammation, they will not fight invading organisms because they are not there. Now, innate immunity is the sole arm of antimicrobial defenses in invertebrates, which account for 95% of all eukaryotic species at present on Earth. It is further estimated that innate immunity counts directly for the major part, up to 80%, of the successful antimicrobial defenses of vertebrates, that is, of 5% of all animal species existing today, including humans. Now, the question is, where does the 80%, where does that come from? Uh, it was a lecture which Rolf Sinkenagel gave at the Lindau meeting of uh, Nobel laureates a few years ago. Where, and I asked him where he had seen the figure and said it was his personal estimate that 80% were really, 80% of our defense were done uh, due to innate immunity. And it makes real sense because, you know, adaptive immunity, just remember, it appears after five to seven days and just imagine the classical situation where you go around the world and uh, you meet many people, you shake many hands, maybe you kiss some people. And so many of those uh, microbes come in co into contact with your, uh, with your skin, with also your um, um, respiratory apparatus and so on. And that could, of course, if you were relying only on adaptive immunity, which would take seven, seven days to protect you, you would already be far away from uh, your first place, first place where you're grounded. And so the system has to be very powerful and very rapid, which is the case for innate immunity. So then, the microbes which have escaped innate immune defenses and to which we refer as pathogens, those are really the passion, pathogens, they give disease, are eliminated then by the adaptive immune system, adaptive immune arm, after it has been activated by innate immunity, a point which I've made during my whole presentation. 
In contrast, and this is important, to the adaptive immune system, which features millions of distinct receptors per individual, this is the result of this uh, gene rearrangement in the lymphocytes, and only in the lymphocytes. So that allows them to have billions of receptors which can recognize virtually any epitope. In contrast to this, the innate immune system has a reduced number of receptors which uh, recognize conserved structures of microbes, fungi, and so on. And this is the important message which was uh, really sort of proposed already uh, by Charlie Janeway and by uh, uh, Ralph Steinman, that you have a first filter. You don't want to get your whole specific system activated, which is an enormous uh, burden of energy, if uh, there's a trivial uh, thing going on. So you have this first filter, and this first filter tells you there's an infection, there's not an infection. It's uh, more complicated, as we'll say in uh, one of the next sentences, this receptor preferentially binds to evolutionary conserved molecular structures present on the cell walls of fungi or bacteria. Some bind to nucleotide sequences with structures particular to bacteria, fungi, or viruses. That's the concept of pattern recognition receptors brought forward by Janeway. Thus signaling the presence of an aggression to the host. That's the essential thing we want to know if the aggression is there before we activate this. This concept has also been extended to metabolic changes, and this is recent, in about 10 years or so, to stress-induced alteration, which likewise alert the host to a potential danger, and then tell the host that the adaptive immune system has to be activated. Essential structural and functional characteristics of the innate immune response have obviously arisen very early in evolution, have been maintained, and in most, zoologi in most zoological groups analyzed today, including humans. Some groups, and namely the insects, have simplified the antimicrobial armamentarium. And this is probably what was the luck for us. We started on a system which has already abandoned in evolution many of its uh, potential molecules, so it was easier to get at the core of the defense as it would have been if we had started with C. anemones. C. anemones were uh, investigated after the fly was understood. Now, in the specific field of antiviral defenses, the interferon arm has been privileged by vertebrates, whereas invertebrates largely rely on RNA interference like plants. You're probably familiar with the work of uh, Mellow and Fire. Uh, and um, then, finally, finally, uh, of major interest in this field was the demonstration that innate immunity activates and to some extent governs adaptive immunity, and then I conclude by unraveling many, but not yet all, mechanisms involved in this process. The efforts of the recent decades have provided the biomedical community with an unprecedented wealth of tools to improve our defenses against microbes, but even more far-reaching for the future are now the potentials to improve or innovate therapies against inflammation, cancer, as we've mentioned, Inflammation is, in the case of obesity, it's inflammation mediated partly through toll like receptors, which is going to be the fatal aspect. Circulatory and metabolic disorders. And that is the end of my presentation. I just want to acknowledge uh, two essential persons. Uh, as I mentioned, phagocytosis and innate immunity was discovered by Elia Metchnikov in the, uh, 19, uh, in the 1880s in Italy. He worked after that at the Pasteur Institute. And Paul Ehrlich was the conceptual discoverer of adaptive immunity. They didn't appreciate the work, the work of um, uh, each other. And uh, they all, each one believed that innate immunity in one case, or adaptive immunity in that case, was the response to infection. But finally, as you've understood now, or what you may have known before, uh, the essence of the work which has been done in the community over the last 40 years shows us that the two really work hand in hand, if I may say so. So they both shared the Nobel Prize in 1908. And then I would like to acknowledge, well, the work which I've explained to you has been, to a large extent, I mean, when, when I spoke about the fly work, has been done in our laboratory and in other groups, but uh, 
Um, the, of course, it's a work of many people, and I'm just showing here uh, the uh, pictures of some of the group leaders of the most influential people. I put Danielle Hoffman first on the left side. After she uh, was my first PhD student, and we married. And so she saw my wife, and next year we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of our marriage, and which happens in France. And Jean-Luc Dimarc, a biochemist, a cell biologist, uh, uh, he has uh, done an important career in the French medical system. Uh, Jean-Marc Reicher, developmental biologist. Uh, uh, Charles Hattou, chemist, an important chemist. Bruno Rometto has played an, an important role in the discovery of the role of the toll pathway and the AMD pathway. Dominique Ferrandon uh, and Julien Royer have done crucial work in the recognition of the uh, beta-glucans and peptidoglycans in the laboratory. Marie Laigue and Christine Kepler were early on in the laboratory in the uh, endocrine studies, and Philippe Bullet also is um, a structural biologist like Charles Hattou. And the future of the laboratory is shown here. Jean-Luc Imler, who is now director of the laboratory and the director of our institute. Jean-Luc Imler is working on antiviral defenses in Drosophila, and we have extended the work now to mosquitoes, which are already, as you all know, becoming an important pest. And uh, Elena Levashina is working on uh, Anopheles and Plasmodium fals falciparum in a malaria context. And the building which I'm showing here is a new building. It's an insectarium in the middle of the city of Strasbourg. And as I often like to say, this with all the mosquitoes, all transgenic mosquitoes in the center of the city, gives us a way to make blackmail to the city. If they don't fund us, we'll just open the windows. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for certainly inspirational lecture. So you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that the main problem uh, nowadays to, to fight against bacteria are the resistance to antibiotics. So I wonder, what is special about uh, innate immunity that make, you know, uh, uh, bacteria doesn't, apparently they don't evolve to go against the, the innate oh, immunity. Gosh. Why do, do don't, don't they develop for example, resistant to the antimicrobial peptides or mechanisms, for example, in the, in the, in the membrane proteins to, be, to escape, yeah. to, not to be yeah, sensed? It's, uh, it's an important question, I understand it. Uh, one difference is that uh, the um, insects produce very large amounts, as I mentioned, 500 micromolar in the blood. And this will be difficult to, dangerous even, to try to duplicate uh, in our system. And we tried to do, we wanted to do that, but we had to bend at a given moment. So um, there is resistance, I'm absolutely, we have not uh, looked at the resistance in uh, flies to, towards various antibiotics. We haven't done that. But uh, other people have uh, tried to find out if uh, it was possible to generate antibiotics which would not be dependent on gene sequences, that's to say. So no resistance would appear over. And there is a new group now of molecules, tacobactins, uh, they refer to, which are essentially lipidic molecules, which also interfer with the membrane and which lead to the death of the uh, microbes. And those are probably, in the future, will be the most interesting molecules to use as antibiotics. And so, but the resistance, uh, certainly, I'm, I would really be, I'm sure that resistance can appear in insects, but has not been investigated. In mammals, it has been investigated, of course. And in mammals, uh, but we do not really use the same molecules. We, uh, the biomedical community, do not use the same molecules as those which are naturally produced. Because of a simple reason, that's also, and we had the same que question at a given moment in our development of a company and so on. If you use molecules uh, which are of the type similar to the ones which we produce, or the insect produce, you may produce antibodies against those molecules, and then you, you block your system. So that's uh, the difficult point. But well, it's a very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have uh, another question related to the antimicrobial peptides. You show a nice picture of the pen with the needle, illustrating that these antimicrobial peptides are produced everywhere in the body. Yeah. Uh, which cells are producing this? Venus of Milo. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which cell types? Well, the, uh, yes. well, the epithelium, the uh, epithelium, uh, most of the cells in the epithelium can do that. 
And there are some specialized cells, in, for instance, the digestive tract, the PANF cells in the crypts and so on, they produce large amounts of defense. And, and why these antimicrobial peptides are not used in medicine? Why are well, they produced, you know, uh, yeah, you're in, right. in large quantities? But you're right, but uh, we just, uh, this brings us back to, to the previous question. If you use, for instance, those defensins, you inject them in large amounts, then you will induce antibodies against them. And you come into a situation of autoimmunity, you see. That's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an important question which, which was raised by many people. And uh, I, we have no time to go into that. We had started a, compa a company, a startup company, and where we were trying to do uh, immunization of mice before going to humans and uh, the problem came that uh, you would induce if you inject large amounts of some of these peptides you induce uh, antibody production of course and then if they are endogenous peptides also you have cross reactivity and then you uh, the system gets totally upset yes uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation thank you uh, and I was wondering uh, I guess you're aware of the technology of monoclonal antibodies and how uh, we can synthesize uh, antibodies specific for the uh, certain antigens, like for example, uh, tumoral protein. Yeah. Could something like that, uh, something like gene editing or uh, protein modification, be done to receptors from to innate immunity receptors, so that we could uh, develop an innate immune response to this kind of of cells? Yeah, um, that's an important point, um, which is of uh, great concern. You know, there's a certain number of autoimmune diseases in uh, patients which really react to their own uh, receptors. And uh, so uh, you're right, there are some problems like that, rare, but still there are. And so we cannot discard it, and you have to be careful before you start with new experiments or new uh, medicine, new treatments, you have to be careful to avoid that aspect, yes. Talk. You mentioned that till the toll light receptor are present all over the central nervous system, in both sides. What are they doing different that well, in that? Or, and also, what made like microglia, what have the microglia in addition to the low light, toll light receptor that made important microglia for the, in, yeah. in that response within the center. Yeah, uh, to make, uh, well, to be short on this, uh, as you uh, know, obviously, uh, macroglia are of the phagocyte type of uh, macrophage type, and so uh, in the brain, uh, as far as I know, uh, they play roles similar to those of the macrophages in the circulating blood. And there may be different, uh, some more specific aspects, which I would not be able to mention now offhand. Now the question is, if in microglia and astrocytes we understand a role in immune defenses, in innate immune defenses, we don't fully understand why they would also be expressed in axons, in dendrites, and, uh, so, and that has not, to my knowledge, has not been clarified today. And uh, there are proposals that they would, that's interesting, but I don't want, don't want the community to become now confused. Toll-like receptors do not necessarily activate NF-kappa B. They can also be as sentinels on the membranes and allow for interaction through their uh, extracytoplasmic domain, lucid rich domain, and sort of serve as guidance, like in the case of semaphorins, and so on, and so play a role in development. That was one of the central questions in all our discussions over the last 40 years. You say that uh, in the fly, you see toll is involved in defense and it's involved in development. It was discovered in development. So do toll-like receptors also play a role in development mammals? Probably not in the sense as we see them play a role in immunity. Say immunity goes via NF-kappa B. And there's no demonstration, as far as I would know, this morning that uh, in development, they would also play a role by or via activating NF-kappa B. So that would be the difference. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. Oh, very kind of you. And I got a question. Which is the organism with the best known to date uh, innate immune system? And is there something we could learn about it to play at humans? Well, the question is important. The answer is very difficult. <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, uh, for sure, nature has been playing with these systems for millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. And so it's a sort of a Darwinian uh, story and uh, the most efficient. Then it's also a matter, of, I mean, take it the other way around. Why did insects drop not like receptors? Sea anemones have this not like receptors, which play an important role, and also in humans, but insects have just dismissed them. So often uh, I express myself saying, nature in the very beginning of uh, when it appeared, I'm not speaking now of Genesis and the book of Moses, but when uh, all this appeared very early on, probably around one billion and a half uh, years, there was sort of a toolbox present, toolbox of defenses against microbes. Because don't forget, when eukaryotes appeared, prokaryotes were massively present and viruses were massively present. So from beginning on, there was a challenge there, you see? And so from beginning on, uh, sort of an immune response system, defense system, whatever you call it, had to be present, had to appear. And that seems to be very, very powerful already in very ancient phyla. I never say primitive because they're so complicated also, the system. And then from this toolbox, according to the ecology, according to the various sorts of aggressors which they would encounter, these animals, they have selected one way or another. But in essence, the system is also a recognition, always a recognition protein, and then a gene, uh, activating gene uh, transcription, having effector genes. And those effector genes are basically the effector mechanisms are basically the same in innate and adaptive immunity and have basically been the same all over evolution. It is just the recognition, as you say, clearly, between innate and adaptive immunity, clearly the major difference is the receptors. And the signaling pathways are relatively close, they're not identical. And then, uh, the, the, of course, the answer through uh, gene reprogramming in the case of lymphocytes, that is different. That has appeared only in fishes. So, uh, although I understand the depth of your question, it's difficult for me to um, give you an answer. What would be the, the best system? What could we learn from it? I mean, if there were anything to learn from, from us now, nature would have probably learned it already on its own. Let's take that as a conclusion. <laughs> Well, I have a, a personal question. Personal question. Uh, do you think that your pre-doctoral and doctoral studies were very important for your career, or you just were lucky and you are training before going into this topic? It was not so important. Um, what, what did you say yes. to the young people? Is it yes. important to do a very good PhD, etc.? Well, uh, if I have to address the young people, I would say like Pope Francis, whom, who am I? to give you advice. Now, I mean, I started in the university uh, going to lectures which were of no interest. I said, frankly, I hope my professors don't listen from above. But uh, we didn't learn much, you see. It was really, it was the end. And just historically, I grew up, uh, well, 20 years or so after the First World War. The First World War had been in Europe devastating in all our countries. And so there was not much which you could learn and everything was going. What was progressing was in the United States. And I'm sure for uh, this country as for the other countries in Europe, uh, science started again in Europe when our first people went as postdocs to the United States, as the Chinese have done uh, more recently, you see. And so science was continuing in the United States and was extremely, it was uh, benefiting enormously from the fact that uh, the German system at that time was throwing out uh, some of the most brilliant people. Uh, they went as refugees to the United States. So science was going on there. To come back then to my studies, I really, of what we did over the last 20 years, I didn't learn anything during my studies, during my lectures, uh, except for the uh, zoology, of course, and the questions of evolution and so on, that was. And so uh, I often say that I have been a student, myself and my colleagues around me. I've never been alone. It's a whole group of people. And uh, we learned uh, by walking. <laughs> you see, we learned walking by <laughs> continuous. So, uh, I mean, there was no biochemistry when I started. There was no chair of biochemistry in the USS Strasbourg. I don't know if there was one here. And that appeared in the 70s, and there was no chair of uh, molecular genetics and so on. That appeared later and so on. And so, um, I, I would say, what was important and uh, was 
the training, the intellectual training, which I got, but essentially already in secondary school, and I owe much to my father, <laughs> to the way of questioning and so on. And, uh, but then, that situation has totally changed now. I mean, now uh, I'm, I know what is going on in terms of lecturing in Strasbourg University. Lectures are extreme, of very high quality and very up to date. And uh, they, um, in the general clubs, they have the last publication on this and that. And so that's, uh, that has changed. Does it answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So it's different for you. <laughs>